Hello, Ivy here. This week's podcast is entitled House of Cards, episode 72. By way of an introduction, I've got a few bullet points which give the overall framework for today's podcast. The seven pillars are weak. None of them are strong in their own right and combined they form a weak foundation to build on. The next layer of the construction is inherently weak, not least because no preparation was ever made for the kind of metaphorical bricks that could be utilised in a way that added value, potentially, and at the very least, maintained solidity in the structure. The approach appears to be picking random bricks that appear available for hire on the help yourself skip on Crown land. Only certain shades of bricks are acceptable. The strength of each brick appears not to matter as long as one is not stronger and longer lasting than the others, as this creates inherent weaknesses to be exposed in all of the others. The methodology and approach seems to be gather the right numbers of bricks from within Crown Property Services and ensure that they fit the colour palette approved by the monarch and the societal pillars that benefit from the structure and provide support and backing for its longevity, i.e. government, police, newspaper barons and their royal reporters, along with televised media and, of course, the aristocracy. There are no visible strategic plans in place in terms of workforce planning. Therefore, when or if any of those weak bricks start to fail, There is never any danger, officially, of the whole structure falling to its knees. Because all the establishment does is place another brick in the wall. Just another brick in the wall is a famous track on the 1979 album The Wall by Pink Floyd. We'll hear more about that later. Next section. Just another brick in the wall. Who would have thought that a trilogy of tracks on a rock album from the late 1970s could ever be used as an analogy in a podcast and article about the UK royal family? Here at Sussex Global UK, we do things a little differently in order to bring key points into the consciousness of the listening and viewing audience. I am in the age group which constitute most of the UK Royal Family supporters, but I am in the minority, in more ways than one, in that age group, as I do not and have never supported any monarchy anywhere as a construct. I do, however, love music among many topics, and therefore my back catalogue of memories and therefore analogies goes way back and deep. So just for a few moments, bear with me. As I outline the framework for this podcast and my belief that the UK monarchy is weak as a house of cards and by using a description of a building structure and framework, and the need for a strong foundation and thought needed for the brickwork used and its placements, and the same level of detail needed when the time comes for maintaining the structure, and the considerations needed for the materials to be used in order to ensure longevity of the structure and not just covering up cracks that have appeared or vacancies, with a plaster that has been in the first aid kit for years and will have very little benefit to the wound and in fact will fall off in a short period and expose the original wound to further deterioration. 
a quote from one of the reference sources listed below regarding the meaning behind all three sections of the Brick in the Wall song and lyrics. The beginning, part one, sets the scene with the protagonist's first blow from life. His father abandoned the narrator, whether that is in death or otherwise, and creates a level of distress. Daddy, what else did you leave me for? Daddy, what did you leave me behind for me? Part two continues the assembling of emotion. Part three concludes the trilogy with the determination that everyone has simply been just bricks in a wall. Think here of a monarch passing and the aftermath within the family of how to move forward. Moving forward in terms of the monarchy as a construct, the firm, and also the emotional impact. As we have discussed in previous podcasts, there appears to be no real workforce planning and much thought, if any, of strategy moving forward. For example, look at the numbers of patronages that exist in the structure and the totals quoted in accounts every year. It is not rocket science to see that even if every person subsidised or was taken care of completely with taxpayer funds, had a proportion of those patronages against their names, it would be impossible to cover all of them anyway. No different to when all these organisations were listed against the names of those who were considered working royals. It is complete nonsense to believe that one individual could physically be present in these organisations throughout a 12-month period. On that same token, it would have looked cosmetically better to spread all these names of organisations out among all those receiving taxpayer funding. It matters not that they would not ever get around to seeing many, if any at all, but that is no different to the fiction written now every year against the names of a much smaller group. The Queen was listed as having the most, and even when she was agile and fit for all manner of activities, she would never and never did make it to even half of those listed, and she did more than all the others. It makes zero sense to put things into records just for the sake of it, when the reality is a stark contrast. The fact that the official line is that the monarchy is now a slimmed down one with only seven senior royals, it's a misnomer. Slimmed down implies that less public funds will be required as we are only paying for seven. Unless everyone else has removal vans booked or payments are going to commence in relation to their accommodation and expenses, then I do not see how this is a saving. I do not see how it's a saving in any way to the public purse. The lack of planning and thinking about the future in terms of the practicalities of being more than a figurehead family when the Queen passed on is staggering. Just like the fact that 77% of royal supporters are over the age of 65. Therefore, does not bode well for the future of the monarchy. The slim down monarchy, a misleading description as to the team who are going to take the monarchy forward because it matches the statistic related to the age profile of those who support having a monarchy at all. 
It is like poetic justice. The analogy of the song also matches in terms of the trilogy aspect. Parents leaving and the emotions that follow. How are they meant to cope? What can be done, etc. No preparation evidence so far from the current monarch as to how things would be and what therefore needed to be in place. Actions hinted at over the years seem to focus on the monarch himself and not the firm. Planning seems to have been around processes and systems and protocols. Establishing a kingship and in so doing ensure that the Queen Consort was looked after in the much talked about coronation next year or whenever. It does not seem to be a priority for those under the age of 65 in the UK population, not in droves anyway. In case some people have missed it, the UK is about to enter into a long, drawn-out recession. And we have moved from three-hour power cuts on the regular to now the possibility of a seven-day power cut. We would not be surprised, therefore, that the resource being directed towards the coronation of a monarch is not high in the thought processes of most people of the UK. The first in line to the throne appears to have similar thought processes relating to when or if he becomes the next monarch. It seems no one is expecting the current one to be in that position for many decades, not least due to current age. The next in line is probably going to continue with the current approach, i.e., what is in it for him? What will the newfound power enable him to do? It would be a pleasant surprise if any of the seven senior royals could show a modicum of understanding about the state of the nation right now. Because none of those who hold power, and therefore responsibility of the inhabitants of the UK, going without basic resources on a regular basis for the foreseeable future, opulence and vanity projects by the British royal family is not going to go down well. UK residents will become powerful bricks in the wall of the UK. People cold and hungry and in increasing debt do not make a country stronger. In the same way, propping up a failing construct like the firm with people who are ill-equipped to make any real tangible difference is building additional weakness into the structure through no fault of their own. The process is not similar to just plugging in another appliance or replacing a light bulb. We need as a country and its leaders to be thinking a little further than a nursery class lesson plan. A few examples of so-called scandals within the royal family, which now Royal Rota no longer mention, only the Sussexes are described as being the ones to bring down the monarchy. There are many more, but I have just chosen a selection to make my point about threats to the lifetime of the monarchy and where weaknesses exist and double standards are in full swing. As discussed in podcast number 36 and republished again recently, you will recognise the playbook used when it comes to distraction stories. The Raw family are known for choosing a whipping boy or a scapegoat to convince the public that all the ills, or at least all the major ones, all point to one person. 
when the target is chosen as being the distraction from more activities that really should concern the British public, the whipping boy individual becomes a scapegoat. If they are lucky enough to escape the toxic mess developing every day. To date, there has been years of Prince Harry being the whipping boy for others' discretions, indiscretions, I should say. And when he marries someone that the British royal family did not approve of, despite what they said officially, which was the opposite, particularly the ethnic origin of the new family member, despite official protestations as to that not to be the reason, there was a further four years of being the UK media chew toy. And since 2020, the Sussexes have become the scapegoat for the British royal family. Many of the public have fallen for the rhetoric, but I am confident that more and more people are waking up to the game being played and will start to recall quite a few major acts by some individuals which could have and may yet bring this family down. Recollections may vary, continue to be the response used by the firm unofficially when asked about certain things. But let me refresh a few memories for them. Each of the following have weakened the monarchy and to ignore these and many others and the many other things and blame a couple from stepping away from abuse and moving to another continent to make a new life and to earn their own money to do so is apparently a death knell to the monarchy in the UK. All the ones we pay for with our taxes that we are never given an opportunity to vote how we feel about having a royal family or not, are not enough to sustain the monarchy. But one person and his fat wife and child leaving is considered a traitor. First one in my list. Underage drinking by Prince Charles at the age of 14. On a boarding school sailing trip to the Isle of Lewis, 14-year-old Prince Charles and his classmates were taken to a pub at Stornoway Harbour, where the prince ordered a cherry brandy. Unfortunately, this caught the attention of a tabloid reporter, and the story made headlines around the world. The incident resulted in the firing of Charles's bodyguard and friend and confidant, Donald Green. Always a whipping boy equivalent nearby. Captain Mark Phillips. While he was married to Princess Anne, the daughter of Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip, Army officer Captain Mark Phillips had an affair with an art teacher in New Zealand named Heather Tonkin. In 1991, a DNA test during a paternity suit confirmed that Tonkin's six-year-old daughter, Felicity, was fathered by Phillips. Princess Anne and Phillips divorced the following year. Princess Diana's private phone call. On New Year's Eve in 1989, Diana, Princess of Wales, spent over 20 minutes chatting on the phone with her close friend, James Gilby, a salesman for British car maker Lotus, and an heir to a gin fortune. During their talk, Diana makes reference to her unhappy marriage, and Gilby repeatedly calls her darling and squidgy. Unbeknownst to them, someone was recording the call. The conversation was later picked up and recorded by two different ham radio operators. Eventually, the tapes made their way to the press. In 1992, 
the entire transcript was published and one newspaper even set up a special phone line that readers could call to listen to the audio. The incident became known thereafter as Squidgy Gate. Prince Charles's private phone call. Not long after Princess Diana's private phone call was made public, her estranged husband went through a similar ordeal. In early 1993, newspapers published the transcript of a secretly recorded phone call between Prince Charles and his longtime friend Camilla Parker Bowles from December 1989. In it, the pair used highly intimate language to express their devotion to each other. And Charles tells Camilla he loves her. The so-called Camilla Gate tape suggested that Charles and Camilla had been romantically involved for years. It further fueled speculation that the affair was the primary reason for this separation. Prince Charles and Diana's public admissions. In 1994 television documentary, Prince Charles confirmed to journalist Jonathan Dimbleby that he had committed adultery, an admission that undermined his attempts to rebuild his popularity in the wake of Camilla Gate and years of media reports on his deteriorating marriage. Then, in 1995, Diana told her side of the story in a TV interview with the BBC's Martin Bashir, in which she discussed her difficult marriage, her struggles with postpartum depression and bulimia, and her own extramarital affair with her writing instructor, James Hewitt. Reportedly angered by this airing of dirty laundry, the Queen wrote to Charles and Diana in December 1995 urging them to divorce. Their divorce was finalised in August 1996. Sarah Ferguson's compromising photographs. A sensational scandal broke in 1992 when Sarah Ferguson, the Duchess of York, was photographed sunbathing in Saint-Tropez with her financial advisor, John Bryan who appeared to be sucking on her toes. She had separated from her husband, Prince Andrew, a few months earlier. Even so, the photographs provoked a backlash against Sarah, who was portrayed by the media as crass and selfish and further sullied the image of the royal family in a year that had already seen the divorce of Princess Anne and the revelations of Charles and Diana's troubles in the tell-all book, Diana, Her True Story. The royal family's silence after Diana's death. In the days following Princess Diana's death in a car accident in Paris on August 31st, 1997, there was an outpouring of grief across the United Kingdom and around the world but the royal family remained silent and they were criticised for what was seen as an aloof response stemming from resentment towards Diana. But on September the 5th, Queen Elizabeth broke the silence with a live address from Buckingham Palace in which she spoke of Diana's warmth and kindness. That same day, the Queen... Prince Philip, Prince Charles and his sons William and Harry greeted crowds of mourners on the streets of London. Prince Harry's visit to a rehab centre. In 2001, Prince Charles arranged for Prince Harry to visit Featherstone Lodge, a heroin detox centre in London, so that 
the 16-year-old prince could get a first-hand look at the dangers of drugs. This came after Harry had admitted to smoking cannabis and drinking alcohol to excess at his father's home, Highgrove House, and at a nearby pub. Although Harry's visit to the clinic lasted just a day and was intended as an educational experience, the press jumped on the story. One of the first of many incidents that gave the prince his bad boy reputation. Princess Anne's criminal offence. In 2002, Princess Anne became the first member of the modern day royal family to be charged and convicted of a criminal offence after her bull terrier Dotty ran loose and attacked two children near Windsor Castle. The princess was fined and ordered to have the dog undergo training. The following year, one of Queen Elizabeth's corgis had to be put down after being bitten by Dotty. Sarah Ferguson's tabloid blunder. Sarah Ferguson became embroiled in another scandal in 2010 when she was caught offering access to her ex-husband, Prince Andrew, in exchange for £500,000. At the time, Prince Andrew was serving as Britain's trade envoy. Ferguson told someone claiming to be a foreign businessman that she could open any door. He wanted, once the payment was wired, to her bank account. The man turned out to be an undercover reporter for the tabloid The News of the World, and the story was published a few days later. Sarah apologised, saying that her financial difficulties were no excuse for a serious lapse in judgment. Prince Harry and Meghan's difficult decision. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex, otherwise known as Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, announced in early 2020 that they were stepping away from their senior royal duties. According to this newspaper, the rest of the royal family, who were not consulted before the news was made public, were reportedly disappointed and hurt. After a family meeting, the Queen expressed her support for her grandson and his wife in their pursuit of a more independent life. Harry and Meghan have since settled in Santa Barbara, California, and have given up their royal patronages and use, and use of the titles of his and her Royal Highness. My comment and personal opinion on that above quote from a newspaper. The Royal Family did know about the situation. They were not surprised when the announcement was made in January. At least they were not surprised about the issue and the concerns that Sussex has had. The family had been involved for many months about these issues and Prince Harry subsequently publicly said there was nothing being agreed. The situation was just being kicked into the long grass. Then a tabloid journalist sent a communication to the Sussexes whilst they were in Canada in November 2019. The location had been given to the tabloids after Prince Charles, as he was then, cut all finance, removed security from the Sussexes, both done without warning, and leaked their location in Canada. Did the same thing again when they moved to Tyler Perry's property in California. The journalist gave the Sussexes 10 days to respond about the story 
that the couple were planning to step back from senior role duties in 2020. On January the 8th, 2020, Prince Charles read out a statement in, back in London to inform everyone that they were stepping back from royal duties and that they would be living abroad from the end of March 2020. Harry released the news before the tabloid ran with their version of the story. Prince Andrew's sexual assault lawsuit in August 2021, Prince Andrew was sued by Virginia Giffrey, who accused him of sexually assaulting her when she was 17 years old. This came two years after Andrew's disastrous interview with the BBC, in which he attempted to defend his friendship with American financier Jeffrey Epstein, who had killed himself in prison while awaiting trial on sex trafficking charges. The lawsuit was settled out of court in February 2022 in a deal that required Andrew to make a substantial donation to the Lady Concerns charity in support of victims' rights. Although Prince Andrew has made no admission of guilt, a statement filled, sorry, a statement filed with the court said that he regrets his association with Epstein and accepts that the Lady Concern had suffered both as an established victim of abuse and as a result of unfair public attacks. In light of the allegations against him, Prince Andrew was stripped of his honorary military roles and royal patronages and can no longer use the title His Royal Highness in official settings. There were many more examples of scandals where people are no longer with us. I have chosen not to mention them in this article and podcast, but they are contained in the reference material sources listed at the end of the article. Of the examples given for Prince Harry, I have the following to say. The rehab incident took place many months before Prince Charles chose to mention it, giving the impression of him being a caring father and that he persuaded Harry to seek help. Harry attended the rehab for one day, as per the original plan. There were other things going on in royal life at the time, but the rehab story was given to the tabloids. Sensible people who understand the rules and the methodology of the invisible contract with the royal rotor is such if there is something that the firm does not wish to be publicised in the media, then another story is given in its place. Hence the, re the rehab story months after it occurred and made to look like it was recent and that it lasted much longer than a day. Another point. The ever famous Nazi costume is always dragged up when detractors from reality like to continue to hammer Prince Harry with the offending image. No mention has ever been printed about William dressed in an equally offensive costume and that he suggested the Nazi costume and they left that said party together with their friends. But you will never see a mention of William in any article published about it. The golden rule is any wrongdoing of the heir or their partners will never be reported on and that someone else will have to be highlighted with a tale of some kind to keep the tabloids happy. Harry was used in his whipping boy role, as he was told would be the case from an early age, and that he would never be able to give his version of events. There are at least two, possibly three, 
other scandals reported on by the press that I have listed in this article, which I consider to be more damaging to the monarchy than someone choosing to leave and work for a living. The people concerned are residing in a 50 plus room property, just two people, and are funded via UK taxpayers and have around the clock security still and are not classed as working royals. But the media will have the public believe and unfortunately many have fallen for the hype that Harry and Meghan are the problem and the cause that the monarchy could be destroyed by their actions. UK public need to wake up and smell the coffee. How anyone can consider the UK monarchy to be secure is beyond me. And to those who think that Sussex is leaving the monarchy and is now resident in another country is the cause of the royal family's demise, need to look closely about the friendships that are members of the royal family have made over the last six or seven decades and how many of those friendships have resulted in many of those people who are not members of the royal family being convicted of serious crimes. Majority of those crimes being in the same category. It raises questions about judgment of royal family members and also whether or not any members of the royal family have been involved in any way. Right now, there is a new case being made about a member of the British royal family and another, which was ongoing for years, was settled by the royal family member with an out-of-court settlement for someone the royal claimed never to have met. These, in my opinion, are far more damaging and will continue to be so, along with many other actions by royal family members to the future of the monarchy. As long as the UK continue to use the Sussexes for distraction stories, knowing that those games nearly caused and surely should know the last six years of activity encompasses many aspects of the law that have been breached. Expect the day to come when some, if not all of those, could end up in a legal setting. Not least because these things have been done against a USA citizen on UK and USA soil. Someone in the plantation behind gilded gates needs to think deeply where this is taking the royal family's reputation which was not great to start with but the treatment of a usa citizen and family in this way and a person of color at that will continue to have global repercussions for decades to come The days are gone when you can abuse people and be left in peace to do it. And to bring this podcast to a close, a dictionary definition of a house of cards. There are a few examples in the reference sources, but one in this article is sufficient to give you an idea. Definition. An unstable or weak structure or plan. Origin of House of Cards. Likening a precarious structure to a House of Cards has been around for centuries. This idea started in the Middle Ages in Europe and earlier in China. An elegant use of the phrase, although far from an early example, can be seen in John Milton's 1641 of Reformation Touching Church Discipline. Painted battlements of polarity 
which want but one puff of the kings to blow them down, like a pasteboard house built of court card. The allusion here is obvious and quite literal, referring to a deck of playing cards. It is possible to stack playing cards in such a way that the cards form a tall tower. The cards in this tower are not flat, but rather standing up on their edge. The structure is layered or tiered in form. Although this tower can look tall and impressive, a slight breeze or jostle will send the entire thing into ruins. The figurative meaning keeps this imagery. An organisation or an endeavour might seem grand or stable at first glance, but it could collapse at any moment. To repeat, although this tower can look tall and impressive, a slight breeze or jostle will send the entire thing into ruins. The figurative meaning keeps this imagery. An organisation or an endeavour might seem grand or stable at first glance, but it could collapse at any moment. That's the end of this week's podcast. As usual, I will speak to you all in the comments later on and during the week. Hope you found this interesting. Equally, I hope you find the reference sources of use to you in researching further. So, bye from me. Bye from Ivy. Bye.